definitely an interesting webinar and we're safety is definitely excited to be sharing this with all of you. So without further ado, I want to introduce myself and introduce the others. Uh, my name is Eric Glenn and I am the program manager for safety. We appreciate you joining the webinar on smart work zone systems. You all have come into the meeting muted and we would appreciate if you stayed muted until the Q&A session. Captions will be on for your convenience. Apologize. Uh, videos will be off during the presentation to maintain bandwidth strength. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box located below on Zoom, and they will be addressed at the end. At this time, I would love to introduce the two presenters. First is Will Vaughn. He is a research associate here in the Division of Technology Implementation here at VTTI, where he is tasked with the research and development of automated and connected vehicles, as well as smart infrastructure prior to his current position. Will worked as a patent examiner for autonomous connected vehicles and hybrid powertrains, and he has had, held various roles with the Department of Defense. Will holds a BS in mechanical engineering from the Virginia Tech. Uh, so that is Will. And then Jean-Paul Toulil-Villea is a senior technology implementer at VTGI, where he designs, develops, and integrates various transportation technologies for applied automotive research. He also interfaces directly with sponsored techn technical and management teams to support research development and delivery goals. Some of his current design work includes ADS system integration for SAE level four and five vehicle automation, connected vehicle to everything, to technology, development of the work zone, interactions uh, scenarios, and cybersecurity and secure message transactions for vehicle to everything communications. In addition, Jean-Paul provides technical oversight, quality, quality assurance, and mentoring to developing engineers and strategic research projects. He holds an MS master's degree in electrical engineering from Technologico Monterey and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Uh, I'm sure I butchered that a little bit, so I apologize, JP. <laughs> but um, really great to have these researchers here. We also want to um, give a shout out to Vida. This is ongoing work to improve safety and work zone um, with the Virginia Department of Transportation. So without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Jean-Paul and Will. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're pleased to provide and share our findings in this, of this project, the Smart Work Sound System. They, we have been working for a year and happy to provide the good news about what, what is the new safety feature that we can provide to the work zones to improve the, the safety and also reduce the fatalities. Um, so we are going to, to start with uh, trying to understand the what's happening on the work zones. Unfortunately, uh, as you know in the plot, and the fatalities have been increasing over the years. And here is a couple plots. One on the left is from the National Work Zone Safety Information Clearing House. And the on the right one, we have the VDOT Work Zone Safety Update. Um, it's pretty clear that we don't see any uh, reduction on the fatalities and fatal crashes that are happening on the work zones. Most, most of the source of these crashes are the distraction or the signaling sometimes is not being perceived correct, correctly from the drivers. And unfortunately, uh, there is uh, always workers in the activity areas on these work zones, they uh, unfortunately uh, lost their their life and we need we are working on trying to understand also what could be the re main reasons and also how we can improve that safety layer that can help those workers feeling safer and also receive warnings and alerts when there is a threat situation 
around them. So um, nationally, uh, in U across US and also in Virginia, we see the, the numbers are in the, in the climb. And hopefully with this technology, the VTTI have been developed and uh, along with VDOT and the VTRC uh, as sponsors, we will be able to deploy these and help workers to feel safer on the works on deployments. So the smart work zone system have four main components. We're going to focus on the first three components today, the smart vest, the smart con, the CV2X base station, and the work zone builder app. The work zone builder app is also part of the system, but it's actually just a software application that provides a, a design feature to actually design a work zone template. Uh, but uh, this, the project incorporates the integration of this application in terms of reading the data from the cloud or directly from the app into the work zone system. Um, on the right, you can see uh, uh, Will and Daniel, two of the, our VTTI team members wearing the smart vest. The smart vest, we're going to provide some description in this presentation, but here is just to give you a glance what the technology is. The CV2X base station is a portable system that can be deployed uh, in a tripod base or also in a pickup truck. And the smart cones are the small gray boxes that are on top of the cones. They also can be deployed, not just on cones, but also on drums across the work zone uh, activity area. So how this smart work zone configuration and system works. So uh, every component have a plays a main, um, uh, uh, important role in the system. Uh, the base station is one of the core components. It comes with the XB wireless uh, link that actually allows to communicate with the smart vest units. The smart vest units have a GPS transceiver that can transmit wirelessly the position of the worker within the work zone. With using this XB wireless link, the base station provide RTK corrections to every single smart vest and smart con device. The RTK corrections are uh, packets, data packets that allows the GPS transceivers to actually provide a more precise position computation. Uh, that computation can provide resolutions up to two centimeter precision in the, in the field. Those RTK uh, requires the base station to survey uh, during the deployment. Uh, right now we have five, 15 minutes. They allow the base station to start broadcasting corrections that can help the, the smart base and smart cones get precision position data. Along with those RTK, the smart, uh, the base station also uh, receives all the data from the workers and that data is being used on the different engines, the process and detects when a worker is in a threat situation. So here in this, uh, in this plot, you can see a red rectangle, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, a yellow rectangle showing on the corners, the smart cones. And inside you can have a a workers wearing the smart vest or even outside. When the workers are actually crossing the boundaries, of this uh, polygon delimited by the smart cones, it will receive a warning that is transmitted again using the XB wirelessly. Uh, that warning can be coming in two different levels based on the threat situation. When they are coming close to the edge of the border of the polygon, they can receive a soft warning. When they cross it, they receive a more intense warning. Also, the base station comes with a CV2X RSU. They allows to receive BSMs. BSMs are a basic safety message from the SAE J2735 standard. They allows receive the vehicle position. So any vehicle equipped with this technology, the base station can track their position and also understand when there is also a threat situation between a worker there is close to the edge and a vehicle passing by at speeds. Uh, 
The algorithm for that is using TTC, uh, time to collision, which is set to four seconds in most of the cases, but that can be configured based on the proximity or also from the works on deployment uh, type. The smart cons, which are also another key uh, device, is used to actually create this polygon, this yellow rectangle that you see. Uh, it doesn't require, uh, um, it requires a minimum of three smart cons to actually delimit a polygon, but it can be up to 10 or 15 smart cons. It depends on the complexity of the activity area within the work zone. These smart cons not just only delimit the geofencing and polygon, but also helps to retransmit their signals from the base station. Because they are using also the same wireless link, their devices act as a gateways. They can actually rely information to workers, for example, that are on the edge of the limit of the range from the wireless link, which is 300 meters. When they are pretty much on those proximities, these uh, smart cones help to enhance and repeat the packets so they can actually receive and transmit data reliably. Um, now, the smart vest, as, as I already mentioned, they provide the GPS, but also they have three HMIs. The HMIs are LEDs, set uh, speakers, and also vibration motors. Those HMIs allow to receive warnings when the system determined the worker might be in a threat uh, scenario. Now we have all the communications within the work zone, but also we support communications with the cloud. Uh, BTTI uh, having managed to send all this information of the position of the workers, the smart cons, back to BTTI BCC cloud. BCC stands for Virginia Connected Corridor, and that that servers and systems provide support to all the connected vehicle technologies deployed here at BTTI Smart Road, but also in Northern Virginia. So all the data that we process by the base station is forwarded to our servers. So we can actually access it, review it, and also trying to uh, analyze what kind of uh, threat scenarios were found and also broadcast this worker position to other vehicles. They, they, they cannot have CB2X, but they have access to our APIs. They can provide the pseudo VSM data that these vehicles generate. So uh, in the next slide, we are going to talk about more of the uh, technical aspect of these devices. Uh, we're going to start with the CV2X base station. The CV2X base station is, as I already mentioned, is maybe the core of the system. They actually have an embedded edge computing. In this case, it's a Raspberry Pi 4 running uh, Linux and running a C++ application. They actually connects different interfaces and provides data to the smart vest and the smart cons and also to the RSU. As you can see on the on the plot on the on the right, uh, the embedded edge computing have three engines. You have the RTK engine, which actually receive uh, data from the U-Box receiver that is in the base station and generates RTK corrections. They are being broadcast to every single uh, smart base and smart code. These this uh, approach reduces the cost of having very expensive RTK receivers in each of the smart vest. So right now, what we are trying to accomplish is reduce the limit of, uh, of weight and also of cost for a smart vest, but also trying to enhance the RTK boundaries and domain that can not only allocate for 300 meters, but even can be extended up to more than 500 meters using the gateways from the smart cons. Um, the XB wireless link, which is also another serial uh, interface to the edge computing, is our main wireless communication channel. 
they sense data between the smart, smart vests and smart cones. And that data is being used for tracking using the geofencing engine. The geofencing engine provides where and when a, a smart vest is within the edge or border of the polygons and actually communicates to the HMI engine to say, you need to send an alert to this specific smart vest device. The communication with the RSU is pretty much over ethernet using a UDP socket where the RSU transmit DSM data from the vehicles and the embedded edge computing forward the GPS location for the workers and the RSU convert that into PSMs. PSMs are the stand, stands for the personal safety message, which is normally a similar to the basic safety message, but is for pedestrians and BRUs. Also, uh, we have the ability to cover travel information messages using the SAE J2735 standard that allows to act actually broadcast the work zone location and signs placement. Um, additional features that we have, the CB2X have a radius coverage of 800 meters and also uh, having the 4G LTE router in the base station allows us connectivity with the VCC cloud. Here is a picture of the base station. Um, there is a lot of wires and cabling that does the connections to the external antennas that we have. We have two GPS antennas, one for the RSU, another for the uh, GPS U-Blox receiver, two antennas for the CB2X channels, and another 4G antenna and XB for the wireless communications. This uh, base station can be mounted on a tripod, but also it can be uh, mounted on a pickup truck or any other SSP vehicle on the works on deployments. Uh, the hardware uses an IP24 enclosure that also uh, can be uh, helpful for uh, environments with uh, light rain and such. So this Marves, uh, what is inside the smart vest electronics? And here is a pretty much a diagram, a high level of what it is. So the smart vest needs to be wear by a worker. So we actually uh, research into what will be the best way to uh, have the small number of components that allows to communicate to the base station, but also uh, trigger alerts to the worker. So we are using a microprocessor. It's a 32-bit processor. They actually have two serial interfaces, one for the GPS U-blocks and another for the XB wireless link, which normally, as I mentioned, that those links are actively running and they are receiving data. Uh, the XB forwards all the RTK information to the GPS engine and the GPS engine data received from the U-blocks is being forwarded to the base station using the XB. So it's back and forth communication between the two receivers. Uh, we have controllers for the LAD, uh, two speakers and two motor uh, controllers or tractor motors. They are going to provide the alerting mechanisms to the worker when there is a threat situation. Uh, the battery pack, which is currently a five volts battery pack provides low power consumption and, um, and up to 22 hours of operation. The U-Blocks, as I mentioned, is a set F9P with accuracy down to two centimeters, which is pretty good and enough for uh, tracking the user and understanding when he's entering or exiting a specific geofencing areas. Um, all these electronics that we developed we uh, uh, we house it inside a pouch. Uh, that pouch is normally uh, where in the back of the worker, and we are going to provide those details in the next sections. That pouch also has, uh, is fully detachable from one vest to another. The smartphone has the same or similar hardware, 
but they don't have any functionality of HMI because the smart con does not need to alert any worker. So it's the same hardware. However, uh, the hardware that will be described in the next sections uh, have two additional uh, items, which is the waterproof USB port for charging and a waterproof power switch. So basically you don't need to access any of the hardware to actually turn on the, uh, the system or even for recharging the battery. This system can last up to 24 hours using the same battery pack that's been used on the smart vest. Now, uh, part of this uh, project the, is the move over loss system, which we are going to talk how this can also complement the safety on, within the work zone. As you know, the move over loss system uh, is a rule that normally the driver needs to obey when they see any vehicle, law enforcement, SSP, or any DOT, they need to chain lanes to avoid, you know, to, to avoid causing accidents or, you know, to avoid with the, with the specifications on the road. Uh, in order to capture and detect when the vehicles are actually obeying the rule, uh, BTTI come out with a, a camera and radar system that allows to track intrusions or actually vehicles that are not following the rule. In that case, uh, the, the system does not take any pictures, it just detects and, and records the speed and also how many vehicles are passing through that area. Uh, this uh, addition to the system uh, can be interfaced with the smart vest to receive an alert when a vehicle is coming through the work zone. And um, for example, it's not reducing the speed is not changing lanes, and it might be, a, you know, a, will be a direct impact to, into the activity area. Uh, this system, as I mentioned, it uses a camera and radar. The camera is used to have perception data to detect the objects, but also to detect the road features because uh, we actually de determine what will be the adjacent lane where the vehicles cannot pass and they should be moving to the next lane. That process of machine vision and perception gets along with the radar data to detect the vehicle speeds to understand what kind of situation is if the vehicle is maybe passing but is going slow and or when a vehicle maybe is not following the rules and actually exceeding the speed on, in the specific locations. So this system will also is part of this project but uh, is still uh, in being enhanced to actually provide HMIs to the smart vest and be able to actually uh, install into the SSP vehicles or even law enforcement vehicles. The, techno the solution is having completed and we are actually working with BitDot and BTRC in how they can adopt this technology in their fleet. Uh, really quick, I'm going to go through the SmartVest RTK system. Uh, as I mentioned, the base station sends corrections to the rover, SmartVest, and the smart cones. And those signals, those corrections, provide the reduction to up to two centimeters. What happens when there is no corrections? And that's kind of a, what is one of the dependencies of the system. If when the, there is no corrections, the the accuracy can jump from two centimeters up to two meters. And that's where maybe false triggers can happen and can be able to not track workers reliable. So this is kind of the core of the solution, RTK. And we have a looking into what would be the best to improve different environments, for example, uh, walls, retraining walls in the work zones, uh, valleys and also uh, locations where GPS might be limited. Here is a comparison of how we, our solution can compare with more expensive ones. Uh, at BTTI, we do a survey and comparison between these U blocks, set F9P base station and RTK, compared with a Novatel DGPS, uh, which is a pretty uh, reliable system for uh, positioning. As you can see, there is uh, two, two lines, red and blue, 
blue is view blocks and Novatel, you can barely see the difference, but there is still some difference, but in overall, the systems have less than 50 centimeters error in most of the cases. About the smart bed best range, we also do the best range testing up to 300 meters. Uh, we exceed that 300 meters, but we believe 300 meters should be uh, one of the soft limits to ensure the reliability and line of sight actually is always happening between the base station and the smart vests and the smart cones. Knowing the smart cones will be in place, we don't need to worry about you know those limits because the smart cones will rely the packets to whatever device there is not on that limit range between uh, the base station. Now we're going to talk about the design efforts. Um, on the design efforts, uh, we have, a, we, we start with the pouch concept, where and how the pouch can be, uh, can be installed in the vest. And that's kind of one of the things that, of the requirements, the VDOT and also so, uh, contractors provide some feedback. It needs to be pretty simple, and very limited in weight. The cost should be as minimal as possible, uh, extended battery life, and also uh, portability, meaning the, the pouch can be, port can be moved from one base to another. So uh, we uh, start talking to different companies about uh, how they can support us, the, the fabrication and the build of these systems, and BTTI, uh, work with uh, Virginia Tech fashion and design team to get the idea into a final pouch uh, bill. As you can see here on the next slides, we have three revisions. The first revision was a, a normal fabric, which was not really, didn't have any waterproofing capabilities. And we put Velcro on the back of the pouch to connect or to actually adhere to the smart vest class three. Uh, on the second iteration, we change the fabric to a more uh, a waterproof uh, fabric, and it's also lightweight. And we keep the the velcros in place, and we have elastic bands for the tactile motor that you can see on the top right uh, uh, picture. In the last revision, the final one, uh, we actually add snap buttons to the back, and also secure in a better way with using the snaps buttons, the PCB board, and also the battery. That way, uh, the, the system and electronics were pretty secure and also able to uh, support the miscellaneous and different tasks of the workers in the work zone field and deployment. The electronics have two revisions. We made the, the design house. Uh, we need to have two revisions due to the supply chains and the COVID uh, prevent us to have the first revision actually built for more than five units. The components were out of stock in US, so we need to be forced to make another design to support a different uh, form factor for the u blocks receiver and the XB wirelessly. So the big difference between the two boards that you see is that we add uh, the GPS as a snap on instead of having the GPS receiver on the board. Uh, also, we reduce the cost by reducing the US, uh, the PCB layers in the design. So that also reduced half the cost. And we still use a similar processor, a 32-bit ARM. So the, the, the performance of the processor was not changed in between the two designs. So here you can see the back and the front, uh, the class three vests that we choose have some LEDs built in. And what we did was access the controls for those LEDs and connect it back to the smart vest electronics. I will let Will to provide some guidance, uh, uh, information about the smart con design and the different revisions. Thanks JP, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, JP and the team um, had this fantastic idea of how to set up this, you know, live work zone to accomplish all of these safety goals and, and increase, increase safety. 
um, and protect those workers in the work zones in case of incursions um, or and rapidly changing work zones to keep track of that. Um, so I had to come up with an idea how to mount the components that came with me. So the, the battery, the PCB, and the GPS receiver. Um, originally, um, we looked to some commercially available products um, like mounts that go onto or lights that mount onto the top of cones or drums. Um, but some of those um, aren't as secure as we would like to be able to be thrown around um, or they took a long time to assemble. So we wanted to have a quicker assembly process. Um, so we thought going that route would be a little too slow. Um, so we came up with a, uh, you can see in that center picture, um, a central ball that would be pushed down through the top of the cone. Um, but we uh, sort of weren't sure of how secure that would be or if that would be too cumbersome to put on and take off. And the um, second uh, idea was to just, uh, most drum cones come with a hole through the center handles um, and mounting those with a simple um, bolt and nut. Um, however, we moved on from that. Um, so we wanted to have something that uh, we didn't have to completely customize ourselves. So we sourced a waterproof enclosure um, and moved to a three tier design. So you can see there's three different layers there. Um, those are laser cut acrylic pieces. Um, they house the battery on the bottom layer, the PCB in the middle, and the GPS on top for best reception. Um, that entire unit can be taken out of the IP enclosure um, at, with just four screws so that each unit can be, or each component can be inspected, replaced. Um, the external enclosure is also uh, made of durable ABS, which is UV resistant. Um, and that waterproofing is going to give us the confidence with a commercially uh, certified product that none of our uh, components inside will make any sort of or be vulnerable. Um, to attach to the cone um, was uh, something we explored, too. So we uh, designed a two piece clamp um, that would be attached to the box permanently. Um, well, at least in the casing, so that the worker would come out to the cone, place it on top, close the clamp, twist the cam handle a little bit, and just clamp that shut. Uh, and that and that design was good. Um, we you could pick up the entire cone, swing it around just by holding that box up top there. Um, but we learned a couple things when we went to uh, some crash testing. So you know we have to imagine this thing in the worst case scenario, and the scenario we we're trying to envision it in is, uh, you know, inclusion, incursion of a vehicle into the smart, into the work zone. Um, and we want to mitigate those consequences and not add any sort of other variables. Um, so what we did is we wanted to reduce a little bit of the weight. Um, we reduced the profile of the clamp. Um, but here, let me, let me go back. So we did a little bit of crash testing here at the smart road um, where we hit it with a larger vehicle. Um, around 20, 25 mile an hour. And we saw where the component broke, um, what stayed intact, and we sort of tried to learn from that. Um, not many plastics, um, at least any lightweight plastics, can withstand a sort of impact, um, especially maybe at decelerating highway speeds. Um, so we focused our efforts towards um, reducing the potential for it to become a, a projectile or enter the cabin of the vehicle. Uh, so what we did is we uh, analyzed where the clamps broke, analyzed uh, where the um, casing broke, and we sort of tried to reduce those stress concentration areas. And um, we also added a steel cable tether that would be placed around the cone as well to further with a uh, steel um, bolt running through the center of the entire apparatus to reduce uh, the distance that the uh, system would travel from the cone in the event of a severe collision. Um, we also switched to a PTG uh, plastic, which is uh, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more shock resistant um, in our 3D printing for the clamp. Um, uh, we, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't controlling the slides. Thanks there, Eric. Um, and <clears throat> let's see, uh, where was it? Oh, and we swapped from that cam handle to a thumb screw. So we want to have it to be able to put on and taken off as quickly as possible from that cone, because if they're going to be doing it a couple times over, we want to eliminate 
the time that the worker is without this system, you know, if they're powering down the system or if they're setting it up, we want to have that safe work zone established as quick as possible. Um, Eric, you can swap to the next one. So that was where we're at. Um, some of the next, the future work is focused on um, commercialization efforts. So designing a new enclosure for um, injection molded plastics, which are stronger, we could source them cheaper at scale, um, as well as um, really streamline the uh, how to assemble uh, all the components inside the box. Uh, we're also exploring mash testing. Um, so that has very strict requirements. So mash is manual uh, of assessing safety hardware. It's um, tests that most uh, federal or de, mm, most safety hardware, jersey barriers, things, uh, any sort of piece put into hardware, put into smart work zones um, has to adhere to on federal highways. Um, that includes uh, heavy SUVs at low speed, high, mid speed and up to highway speed, as well as low sedans. Um, so in the case of a low sedan, you have the cone and the top unit is above the hood line. So that comes directly into the windshield. So we thought about rounding the corners um, and trying to make efforts to not have that ingress the cabin of the vehicle. Um, so I think next JP is going to talk a little bit more about the move over law and where we're uh, at with that. Thanks, Will. Uh, here is just to give you some, uh, during our testing, how the system were detecting vehicles through the polygons. You can see a red polygon there drawing in the adjacent lane of the deployment. And the vehicles that are going to pass through that polygon will have a bounding box. They will be coming to red when they are passing by. So this is how the system was tracking vehicles. They were entering that polygon and actually exiting too. So I think I have uh, maybe problem with the play player. Let's see if it keeps loading. Okay, well, but uh, let's see if we can load more. Yeah, there you go. Um, you can see more detected vehicles. Uh, obviously, there is some challenges in the border when the vehicles and bounding box might be overlapping, but that's kind of uh, some limitations of the depth or in-depth detection with one single camera. So uh, here is another video using the raw data received and checked by the vehicle and our ROS system. This is actually what the computer is uh, reading from the camera and radar and actually uh, fusing between the two. On the center, you can see some dots coming and increasing from very uh, negative to positive and also uh, within the negative region, those, those uh, dots can tell you that are the speeds detected and the position detected from the radar. Uh, we have a team from GCAPS, which is uh, one of our partners. They help us to develop an algorithm to actually fuse the two data sets, the camera and the radar all together. Um, so on the smart road, uh, how we are going, how we test the, 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 uh, the systems where we were deploying the smart base station, the smart vest and the smart cones, and we were collecting several hours of data, trying to improve the, the accuracy, the algorithms, and also uh, improving the detection. So here is some uh, snapshots of how we were collecting data and how we can visualize it. The first one on the left shows uh, one of the geofencing points and waypoints classifications for a specific portable unit. In, in this case, could be instead of being a, a geofencing, it, it comes to our, as a system that can be installed on a vehicle or a moving vehicle within the work zone. This feature was requested during our uh, deployment and that was added before the end of the project as a very important request due to the fact that there is always machinery or even moving vehicles within the work zone and actually those are the major 
cause of the accidents that can happen inside the work zones. So what we did was uh, we developed a, a software and also the logic that actually tracks these portable devices. And here on the first plot, you can see the green uh, waypoints shows when the, the smart vests are not really close to that device. When the device is getting closer, have a, a blue, a really narrow blue line, because that's when the, the smart vests receive a warning of a soft warning to say, hey, you, you are already getting close to this device. And red is pretty much when the vest is within a, a specific region or, or distance from the device. Those distances can be configured based on the uh, system deployment. But uh, currently it was set to five meters, but uh, based on the works on deployment, it can be adjusted accordingly. On the right side, you can see a, a triangle shape. And what we were doing there was kind of understanding the accuracy when this base station is close to buildings or when the GPS is limited. Uh, so uh, we were tackling that uh, that case because there is some, some uh, corner cases when the GPS cannot have the same reliability when it's close to buildings or for example, on environments where is missing satellite information. So as you can see, uh, pretty much all the dots make sense. You can see the orange uh, waypoints are the smart cones and they actually form a triangle. You cannot see the one in the corner be because there was a bunch of red waypoints, but uh, it's very clear that you can see a jump of a waypoint on red within the green area. That was kind of a, a miss or uh, a erratic GPS reading and classification due to the uh, error of the GPS RTK corrections. In the last one on the bottom uh, figure, you can see how the smart cones can be adapting to the shapes. So we start with three cones on the left, and then we extended that to five cones. They were uh, dynamically changing and forming a shape and providing to the smart vest the classification. So here the, the green waypoints determines a safe area and the blue ones determines the area where the workers might be getting a soft warning and the red ones are when they are upside of the polygon area. So all these algorithms were testing pretty heavily on the smart road before going to a deployment to ensure that we address different cases uh, most of the challenge were the polygon uh, uh, transmission and how the formation is and the termination of the uh, corners. Because if you, uh, for example, you make a concave uh, a polygon, might be a different behavior when it's uh, the opposite. Um, we have two demonstrations. One demonstration was in Wise County. Uh, BDOT and uh, help us to coordinate with uh, GSI, which is one of their contractors to actually visit one of their uh, work zones. They were actually uh, making a constraint wall in, in one of the US 23 highway sections. And here, what was interesting was the work was underground and close to the wall. So uh, our base station was deployed uh, in, the, in the main road. However, the smart cones and the smart vests were actually under that level. Uh, the location was not ideal for the RTK corrections. They actually was not, uh, the survey never finished on time. Actually, after 30 minutes, we didn't have a precision under one meter. So. Uh, what we what we uh, had was some false triggers due to the lack of precise corrections in that uh, scenario. Um, some of the post field testing actions were uh, how we can raise the antenna by using a trailer with extended antenna pole. Also, uh, we look into better antennas that can provide more sensitivity sensitivity in this kind of deployments. Uh, we actually replace the antenna by another one, they have better sensitivity and allow us to have uh, faster corrections, but also more uh, able to actually 
de be deployable in these kind of scenarios or environments where the satellite availability can be reduced. Um, here is some pictures of the deployment. Uh, we put the portable device in this in this uh, machinery the on the back, uh, and the workers they were actually uh, closing by. They were getting warnings accordingly. This is one of the feedbacks from these workers where is the they don't even want they didn't want to have the warnings when the machinery was not moving. So as long as it's moving, uh, they prefer to have the warnings only on that on that case. And BTTI was able to address that and actually add that feature in the next deployment with the dot. Uh, in Northern Virginia, we have also another demonstration. Unfortunately, due to coordination, we couldn't make it in, the, in a real work zone, but we did it in a parking lot that was pretty extensive, and we were able to demonstrate all the features, including the smart con, smart vest, and the base station. Uh, here, uh, it was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty good uh, environment. Uh, GPS was uh, on point, and we have RTK and the the VDOT uh, workers were able to to actually feel the and actually have a sense of how the technology works. We provide a technology uh, overview, but also uh, most of the VDOT team members were able to wear a vest and go through the polygon that we create and uh, and have a warning trigger. That white truck in the middle also have where it had the portable unit on the back, that white box. That white box was serving also as a trigger when the workers were getting closer and the, the truck was moving. Only when the truck was moving, the, actually the warning was generated. So for the move over loss system, uh, here's some also, also pictures of the deployment. Uh, these pictures shows the, uh, they have a, uh, the radar and the camera built in in a plate and that are connected to our embedded computing system. And, and I will be discussing this really quick. I know that we are pretty much over time and just have a couple more slides to go through. Uh, we also instrument the system in a TMA, which currently is collecting data. Uh, we put our platforms in the in one of the boxes of the TMA and we put this portable unit, the camera and radar in one of the arms so they can be adjusted in terms of angle and field of view for the deployment. And here is our latest iteration with a smaller plate and the radar and camera pretty much aligned so they can provide a more accurate determination of the detection of vehicles passing by. On results, as I mentioned, the position accuracy is a major factor. So RTK needs to work to provide us the accuracy needed. And, and that's where we were able to achieve with these U-Block set F9, F9P receivers. Uh, obviously, we need to do some uh, adjustments when for the smart vest for antenna placement when it's not fully uh, horizontal to the ground. In terms of conclusions and recommendations, uh, BTTI was happy to have this system deploy and receive good feedback from VDOT, BTRC, and also the contractors. Uh, we were able to demonstrate the system accuracy and the warnings at different levels and how the smart cones can have uh, also the ability to adjust the polygons in the activity areas in a dynamic way. Uh, the, the hours of operations also was pretty good. And I think uh, one of the suggestions uh, that we gained were make it even light, lighter and also trying to focus on IC configuration of the polygons by using other devices like a, a geoplotter or using the Workzone Builder app to actually uh, readjust that polygon. Well, do you want to comment on the match testing too? Um, I touched on it a little bit, but yeah, uh, efforts would be needed uh, to certify this for a federal highway, um, at least as recommended by um, some of the experts we spoke to. Um, just the the requirements 
um, are that it <clears throat> does not ingress a vehicle or become a potential projectile. Um, and that projectile is um, sort of subjective, but there is a sort of radius from impact um, that we have to follow. Um, so we're not necessarily worried about either of those things, um, but we would like to um, keep the take those into consideration and move forward with some of the future concepts we have. Thank you. Um, as part of the edu education of workforce, workforce develop the development products, uh, BTTI uh, applied for the ADSA Innovation Awards, creating a video, and that video uh, pretty much highlight the technology and how it can improve the safety on the work zones. And we were able to get a second place on this year at SAWARTS, which was pretty good for us to actually uh, get access uh, to commercial opportunities. And that's where uh, pretty much uh, the next slide is. Uh, we actually fill a US provisional patent and also with the help of uh, BT, BT, uh, BT, and we are in the process of licensing this technology to commercial companies. It's still not fully, but uh, that's kind of uh, one of the overcomes and outcomes of this project that actually we are very happy to share uh, with you guys. Um, we have uh, still working with BDOT and BTRC for adding additional features for the move over law, as I discussed, and also uh, creating an application that can be used during the deployment to have more details and the status of the system during the uh, the deployment. That app will provide number of alerts, uh, how many workers are active, how the RTK system is is uh, is doing, and also able to modify the polygons for the geofencing or activity area dynamically. Thank you again. Uh, um, let me, uh, we're going to the QI uh, questions and answers, but uh, again, uh, thanks for safety and our sponsors, VDOT and VTRC for, for this project and opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, JP. I'm sure we have a lot of questions and we will stay a little bit over time just to uh, answer all. I know uh, Mohammed Khan has two questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and say those. The first question is, what the cost price? What is the cost price of cone initial designs? And secondly, normally the construction site is too wide. Is the proposed design uh, feasible? Uh, Mohammed, would you like to maybe unmute and uh, clarify that uh, second question? Uh, maybe the first one. Are you? The initial design, like what did we start with? Um, the initial design was all 3D printed. Um, so it was on the order of maybe a dollar of plastic. Um. Back. Uh, what I was saying is the cost for the smart vest is around $300. Uh, due to the U blocks receiver, the GPS with RTK is the $300 including the PCB, the receivers, and uh, the best itself might be additionally 30 to $40. So we're looking into around 350 total for a smart best component. Uh, about the cameras, I didn't use a stereo camera. Uh, I use as uh, it was a simple camera HD, but what we use was NVIDIA Drive SDK in order to provide us perception data, the tracking of the vehicles, and also we use the the deep neural networks to actually detect the lane markings. So NVIDIA Drive provides those DNNs and perception data uh, that can be used for these kind of implementations. Yes, the, the weather, the base station, the CB12 base station have been tested in weather conditions, different weather conditions. Actually, in Northern Virginia, we deployed when it was around 105 Fahrenheit, pretty hot, and everything was working as expected. And all the, all the components selected are autom automotive grade. So they, 
they normally can support over 85 Fahrenheit, but uh, one of the follow-ups were using a, a enclosure with some cooling, but that also the reduces the IP proofing for waterproof applications. And just to uh, give people a chance who don't have access to the chat or um, won't be able to read what's in the chat, uh, that was an answer to the question that said, has the base station tested in different weather conditions? <clears throat> and there's also two pre-questions that were asked uh, before the presentation. So the first one is a two-part question, which is this person would like to know the weight of the vest and how easy it is to work in. Also, are there items in the vest changeable to another vest? I believe Bodhi spoke to that, but if you can again. Will, you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So um, the pouch and all the electronics inside are less than a half a pound, uh, less than eight ounces. Um, they're attached via Velcro and um, rivet fasteners. Um, so it's very easy to take uh, on and off. There is a minor integration of um, just the wiring, um, but it's minimal. The wiring can be removed. It's just to access the LEDs and it just, uh, it can be removed entirely from the pouch, but the pouch is detachable for, for example, uh, in our first deployment, all those class three beds were pretty dirty after the deployment. Uh, you normally need to wash them and then we can reinstall the pouch again to, for normal usage. Uh, we add the snap buttons for additional secure mechanism that also helps for a specific activity task. The workers can be done and they they feel like a, they want to have that pretty secure in the back. Okay, thank you. And then there was another question, which is, what is the latency between a vehicle crossing into a work zone and a notification to the workers' vest? Okay, so uh, in terms of latency, the, per the perception you, uh, takes 100 milliseconds, that 100 milliseconds to actually tell or advise the system there is a vehicle coming. However, that doesn't mean that's the latency. Uh, there is other factors involved in the calculation when the workers can receive the warning, which is, I mentioned, is the time to collision. So based on the speed of the vehicle approaching the work zone and the distance, we can calculate a time to collision. The, we normally keep it between four and five seconds to ensure that you know, there is enough time for reaction for the worker. So it's not like a two seconds or one second, you give the four seconds for the worker to actually look ahead, look around and actually make an action of stepping in into the work zone or actually understand what is the threat situation. JP, I believe Jose Salazar unmuted. Did you have a question? If not, is there, if there's any other questions? Okay. If not, that is fine. If you don't have any other questions at this point, you'll still have an opportunity to ask both of the researchers uh, questions later on. So again, I'd like to thank every everyone again for joining the webinar. This webinar will be uploaded to YouTube and I will notify everyone via email when it's completed. And once again, I will CC the researchers if you have any further questions. I will also upload the PowerPoint in that email as well. And I also once again want to thank VDOT and VTCRI for their collaboration and partnership on this safety project. Um, registration is also open for our next webinar on autonomous delivery vehicle as a disruptive technology, how to shape the future with a focus on safety by Dr. Shabashi Das, scheduled for October 20th, 2022 at 11 Eastern time. Uh, you can register on our safety website with the link provided in the chat. So once again, thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you at the next one. And thank you, Will and Jean-Paul for putting this on for safety as well. Really appreciate it.